Bases dropped on a Wednesday morning here in SDH land. Soccer down here live for October 23rd. MLS Cup playoffs return tonight. We'll get you set for both matches this evening. We'll get you set for the USL Championship first round of the postseason as well. There's lots of news and nuggets to dig into, and we'll start to look ahead. Atlanta, Philadelphia tomorrow night. Eastern Conference semifinals at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Just for planning purposes, just so you know, we'll be on the air on 92.9 The Game tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Kickoff will be just after 8 o'clock. After us, the Battle of Los Angeles. So you, you got to plan on that one, too, because that's going to be a must-watch with LAFC and the LA Galaxy, El Trafico. That's a 10.30 TV time, probably closer to 11 kick, I'm assuming. And some of that might depend on what happens in Atlanta preceding it because it's the postseason. We saw it a lot in the first round. Extra time comes into play. We've not seen penalties yet in the postseason, but it'll happen at some point because it always does. Hopefully, not for Atlanta United because hopefully they come out and play one of their best matches of the season because, John, I mean, that's that's where you're at right now. You've got to find a way, even without Miles Robinson, even without Michael Parkhurst, for Philadelphia, without Casper Shabilko, possibly, although he's listed as questionable. I don't know if you go from questionable and being out of the 18 in the first round to being in the 11 a few days later, but maybe. Alejandro Bedoya, there's a possibility you don't see him to start. He's not listed on the injury report, but you saw him leave the match on Sunday due to a quad injury that kept him out of a match on decision day. Um, This time of year, everybody's banged up, nobody's 100%, and you still somehow have to find your best soccer in all of that. Yeah, and we'll get into formations and ideas and thoughts and patterns and things like that. But I, I take injury reports this time of year with the Stanley Cup grain of salt you know, if someone's leg was shattered and you saw it in the Stanley Cup playoffs, it's a lower body injury and that person is questionable. So no matter what is put out there publicly, we're not going to know what the real story is. And we may not even get the real, real story, but as close to the real story as possible when we see the 18s come out an hour beforehand. And I know that, you know, that each team going in has – their own issues one way or the other that have to be tackled. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the 18s look like for Atlanta and Philadelphia tomorrow with what we know and what we've seen. So this time of year, it's come up with a game plan, survive in advance. Doesn't have to be the prettiest thing in the world, but the bottom line is if you end up with one more than the other guy, at least one more than the other guy, you move on to the next round and that's what counts. You got a sense of the intensity last night in the Copa Libertadores. It's not the league playoffs, but it's the equivalent of the Champions League in South America. And the intensity between Boca and River was just off the charts. Boca trailing 2-0. They do it over two legs. Uh, Boca t- trailing 2-0 coming in. Couldn't get anything in the first half. They did get one with 10 minutes remaining to make it pretty frantic at the end. But... You saw a team in River Plate who, I guess the the biggest takeaway for me watching them in this cauldron at Boca was just how untroubled they looked. I mean, you're talking about Marcelo Gallardo comes into this with, I thought, the right game plan. Same 11 as the first leg. They never looked overextended they never Mm -hmm. were in like a down number situation they never got caught on the break it felt like there were always three white shirts to two blue shirts everywhere on the field it was kind of a master class in how to handle the pressure of these types of matches and river moves on to the copa libertadores final um 
it's a it's a big one. And and if you didn't get a chance to see it live, I know BN Sports will replay it this week. Take the time to to watch this, and if you get a chance, especially to watch it ahead of tomorrow night's match, because format's different, but the pressure and how especially River handled the pressure, I think that's what you are. I think that's what Atlanta's trying to be. I think they want to be a team, and we saw a good bit of that in the first round against New England, where Atlanta was very smart. They didn't get caught except for the one misplay from Leandro Gonzalez Perez where it was a 2v1. Other than that, they really didn't get caught out at any major point in the match to where you you were worried that you were going to concede. And this time of year in these kinds of matches, that has to be the first priority is security. After the first say 10 minutes with your your natural frantic nature of trying to sit there and assert what you want to do honestly it seemed like Boca really didn't have any answers and no matter what they were trying you saw River Plate they were there they were there it was calm it was controlled at times it was a little heated when it came to individual tackles and things like that but oh, for me yeah, it just welcome seemed to the, welcome to a big game yeah. I mean that, that's yes. nothing new yeah but you know, it just seemed like once River Plate had control of the match and in their pacing and in their ideas, Boca to me just did not have any answers. And along those same lines, and Nathan Pugh, I think, has already won Wall Pass Wednesday for us this morning in wondering what's the best tool for the removal of confetti. Uh, the leaf blowers did okay, but that but was... But you went to the furthest point of relief instead of just turning around and getting rid of it and cutting the field in the quarters. You're, you're... you're taking those leaflets. It wasn't, it wasn't confetti. Those were like pamphlets and leaflets and, and loosely binder paper. Papelitos. And, play and just blowing them all the way over to the opposite corner. It's like, come on, man. That would be a come on, man, for me. It's like, I mean, just the turn thing, around... Man. Thing to get that worked up about, but you know, push okay. it over. Well, it was what 15 minutes. I mean, 15 minutes of waiting for the thing to go, and we were at the brew house, and everybody was jacked up. And I don't care what kind of they're, they're going... trying to blow those things out of the way. I don't think whatever strategy you had was going to make that much of a difference. But just just turn around and take it over to the near touchline, your nearest touchline, instead of taking it at a 45 degree angle and going like 90 meters the other way. Just turn around and get rid of it. There's plenty shovel of stuff it into in the middle the, of the field, John. It didn't really make a difference. Shovel it into the coaches' boxes. Or you can't shovel benches. it with the leaf blower. There wasn't a Figuratively. strategy. I think that I think you were more worked up about the leaf blowers than Boca's tactics. And that shows you how much control River Plate had in the match. It's just like, come on, let's get this thing started. And you're sitting there going, it's like, get it, either get it started with all of the the paper on the pitch, or turn around and just blow it and get it over there. It's like. Come on, guys. You know, do that. It's not how it works. Ugh. They didn't have industrial strength leaf blowers. Get get like the uh, the they things like three the, guys. The, the the airplane engines like NASCAR has when they're trying to dry a track. Yeah, those bring the helicopter awesome. down and just blow the papelitos all over the place. Can we talk about the crowd at the brew house last night? Yeah. How cool was that last night? Just in general, to have all of the. All of the smack running that we had from Welcome to uh, soccer. I mean, that's that's I what know. it is. That's that's how it I is. Know. Like, but that's that's exactly what this game does. I mean, soccer over there featured uh, nearly two friends coming to blows over Liverpool and Manchester United. <laughs> Not really, but maybe there might have been a slap or something. At Purple least. blows. Um, then we had a a long dissertation on Crystal Palace, which was very interesting. Um, yeah, it was fun. I mean, lots of different folks who, who came out, who listened to the show on a regular basis. So thanks to everybody who came out, came up, bought a scarf, had different things to say about listening on a regular basis. Trust me, we all really, really appreciate it. And and those are the kind of the, the fun things about the sport is these types of games become a celebration of the sport. And this one was, I mean, 
it wasn't the greatest, most beautiful game. It had a level of intensity that you don't see on a regular basis. And that's the thing about soccer, I think, compared to any other sport for me, is every time going into the opening whistle, whether you think you know everything about the two teams that are about to play, you don't. Because every single match is different. Something different happens every time. And sometimes you get crazy 4-3 games. Sometimes you get nil-nil, but it's nail-biting. Sometimes you get a 4-3 game that's crap. Sometimes you get a scoreless draw that's crap. You never know. And that's the, the amazing thing about this. So last night... I think what what we learned from it overall in this was River Plate is one of the best South American club teams of the last few decades. This group that won the Libertadores last year on course to maybe win it again, at least be in the final the following year. They won it in 15 as well. This is amazing work by Marcelo Gallardo, who I think is a manager should be in high demand. Um, yep. It was a, a statement for River Plate. And if you're Boca Juniors, you have to go back somewhat to the drawing board. Now you have to go back into league play and make sure that you win the league because the amount of money you've spent, the amount of expectations that you know, your fans have, it's not okay to get to a Libertadores semifinal. You have to win the thing. Um, one thing that was very, very cool last night that I was talking to our friend Howard Hamilton about soccer metrics on Twitter, and it was actually mentioned a, a good bit in the Argentine media after the match. You, you saw, if you watched the game after the final whistle, you saw Boca fans move to tears, first off, because their team was out. Lots of that. But also applauding them, yes. singing for them supporting them even after the final result in in a match where we've seen stupid things happen between the two teams and you didn't have river fans in the building in this one you don't do that among the big teams in Argentina anymore because of things that we've seen outside the building last time around and many other times in Argentine soccer but to see it not be ugly not be negative towards a team in Boca that, that played extremely hard I mean, they went for everything, and they fought and fought and fought. I don't think they had the right group of players. I don't think they have the right playmaker in the middle. I don't think they had anyone who could solve the the problems that River was presenting to Boca. But the fact that their fans gave them that support afterwards, very cool to see. I'm, it was very cool that it didn't get negative, that it is – all right, this hurts, this sucks, we're out of the Libertadores, we watch River celebrate on our field, we haven't been able to beat these guys in a long time, but we still have things to play for, we still have the league, and now the league becomes a priority where there's seven teams within three points of the top, you extend it to four points of the top, you're going down to like nine, ten teams. It's going to be an intense run-in with about, 10 or I think it's about 14 games left for everybody, maybe 13. So Fanatis, first off, get it, watch these games because Boca yes. in the league is going to be a, a pretty fascinating story to see and river in the league, how they balance it. They've been able to balance it so far. They're still within shouting distance of the top. They're in that gaggle of teams near the top, how they balance it with going into a Libertadores final. That's a one game final. They'll face the winner of Flamingo and Grimio tonight. That's on BN Sports, Fanatis, Fubo TV, whatever, however you get to be in sports. You can watch that tonight. Flamingo at home, they're the overwhelming favorite. They dominated the first leg. They should get through. You never know how these things go, but they should get through. And if it's Flamingo, River, that's an epic final. And that's a that's a big deal. And, and there's a very good chance we will do something around that final. It's scheduled for Santiago, Chile which if you followed the news, Chile is not exactly a great place to be having a major international sporting event at the moment. Right. So there is time before that match would happen. It would be in November, but 
We'll have to wait and see on that. Connell Ball just can't catch a break. <laughs> they can't catch a break with their Libertadores finals these days. It was a fun night. Thanks to everybody who came out to the brew house for soccer over there and, and stuck around for the game. It was a fun crowd. Uh, the Fernet E. Coke was flowing. Um, I think they did pretty well with that special. Uh, the, the Fernet bottle, I saw it off the bar many, many times. So Good. Good times at the Brew House Cafe last night. Thanks to Saqib and everybody over at the Brew House for taking good care of us. We'll be back over there next Monday for our next soccer over there. But we're going to take a break now, come back, jump into the MLS Cup playoffs for tonight. Also, the USL Championship playoffs. We'll get you set up on what their playoff format is. It's a little different. We'll give you the breakdown on all of that after we take a quick break. Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student-athletes right here in Georgia. High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders. It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen, following directions, accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky & Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company. Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome back. Soccer Down here, October 23rd. Wall Pass Wednesday. Get your Wall Pass Wednesday questions and thoughts in on Twitter at Soccer Down here. Let us know what you're thinking about with one day to go until Atlanta and Philadelphia face off at Mercedes Benz Stadium in the Eastern Conference semifinals. The Eastern Conference and Western Conference semifinals kick off tonight, and we'll get to that here in just a second. Let's start with the USL Championship, though. So, 10 teams got in in each conference, and they have a play-in round with 7 hosting 10 and 8 hosting 9. Correct? Yes. Let me make sure I've got this right. So, yes. in the East, the Charleston Battery got in, but they have to go to Ottawa yeah. tonight, 7 o'clock. Birmingham got in as the number 10. They've got to go up to carry North Carolina and face North Carolina FC. That's tonight at 7 o'clock. Out west, Austin Bold hosting the LA Galaxy 2. That's an 8.30 kick tonight. And in 10.30, a pretty intriguing matchup. New Mexico United did get in in their first season, hit a slump middle of the year, bounced back at the end to secure the playoff spot. But they get in as the 10 seed, which means they have to go on the road. And they're going to a town that's got a little bit of energy right now, Sacramento. They're going to face the Republic. The first match for the Republic after their move to Major League Soccer was made official. That's a 10-30 match tonight. All those are on ESPN+, Plus, by the way. We have uh, candy purveyors on these matches? We do. That's we true. do, okay. actually. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. let, let's start in the East. All right. 
Which matchup would you like first, sir? Uh, let's go with the one up in North Carolina. North Carolina FC against the Birmingham Legion. Okay. Full-time result, North Carolina FC. Once again, this is courtesy of our friends at Bet365. North Carolina FC, minus 225. Birmingham Legion is plus 400. And the draw option Which would go is to penalties plus, or go to extra time, right? right? Plus 350. Yeah. Okay. Plus 350. So I'm assuming the draw option would mean after extra time? Yeah. Okay. I don't think it goes to penalties either. I, I North Carolina, to me, is the better team. They, I don't feel like they should be the seven seed. I think they have more talent than that. The yeah. Eastern Conference has been weird this season because you had different points in the year where the Tampa Bay Rowdies were the best team in the East. They finished fifth. Red Bulls, too, were the best team in the East for a while. They finished sixth. Pittsburgh ended up winning the East. Nashville, second. Indy 11 was a team that was just unbeatable for a while. They finished third. Louisville City was a team that was pretty poor for a long time and then hit a run and they finished fourth. North Carolina, to me, is is a team talent-wise that's in that top four conversation. Birmingham Legion, it's been a good first year. Feels about right for them to be the 10th team in the east based off what we've seen from the legion so to get here they're gonna fight they're gonna try to make it difficult i just don't think they have the talent to really run with north carolina and at home uh, i think north carolina fc takes the win comfortably i think it's like a 3-1 yeah and remember that this is the uh, the sunset for austin to lose and we'll try to catch up with him once the season's over just to kind of get a a feel for his career and everything. So it's just another one of the subplots, but yeah, I was looking at North Carolina FC pretty comfortably in this one too. Yeah. I think they find a way to get it done. What about up in Ottawa, the fury hosting the Charleston battery. And this one, they think might go for a while. Can see Ottawa minus minus one ten. Charleston. This is full time result plus two twenty. draw plus two sixty. To qualify and move on, Ottawa minus 188, Charleston plus 137. <sighs> and I we really have method of victory this as well. One goes. Method of victory. Ottawa winning, you got the 110 and the 220. Extra time, Ottawa plus 900, Charleston plus 1600. Ooh. And then both teams at plus 1,400 in penalties. <sighs> oh, See, man. and now you, I, you I've got I'll, – I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. I think it goes to penalties. I think Joe Kuzminski comes up big. I think Charleston moves on. I don't know. I just I, – I don't think this has been one of the better Charleston teams. Ottawa – has had times where I feel like they've been a, a a good team, a better team than an eight. Yeah. I I think they've had better moments than Charleston this season. I think Charleston is kind of who they are this this time around. They just don't have as many players who can lift you. Now they can grind it out and they can That's what take I this to extra now. time. I think Ottawa wins an extra time. Yeah, I figured this was going to be turned into a, a grinder of all grinders, and it goes to goes to penalties. And so that's that's why I was thinking my rationale in all of this. It's going to take a while. I think but so. I'll go ahead and yeah. I so said I'll go ahead and take the dog in that one, and then take it all the way to the end. Okay, Austin and LA Galaxy too. All right, let's see what we have. Full time result. I think this one I think this one's gonna go for a while. Austin plus one twenty five. Los Dos plus one seventy five and the draw is plus two thirty. Hmm. I think Austin's a better team and, and the second teams it, it's a little tricky in, in these kinds of moments, especially when you know, Galaxy are still in the postseason, so they're not going to get any players to go over and play in this one that would factor into the the first team. But right. then when you look at the way these games have played out this season, 
Galaxy 2 won both of them. The 1-0 in the first game in Carson. Second match in August in Austin was a 3-1 win for Galaxy 2. I think Austin's the better team, but yeah. I think they get through. I think they get it done. I think Austin wins in regulation. Okay, I was going to say Austin wins in uh, in extra time. That's what I was going to do. I was going to go with that. Draw no bet is minus 138 for Austin and even money plus 100 for Los Dos. I'm going to go with the Austin Bold. I think they find a way through. Last one of the night, Sacramento and New Mexico United. New Mexico, a lot of firepower. They can score goals. Sacramento is going to be coming in feeling pretty good about themselves. What are the uh, candy purveyors thinking? Sacramento, full-time, minus 118. New Mexico United, plus 225. And your draw after 90 minutes is plus 275. Draw no bet leads to Sacramento at minus 225. New Mexico, plus 162. You're over under at two and a half. They're saying the over is minus 163. What was that win number for New Mexico? Plus 225 in uh, full-time. Uh, might be just my heart speaking, but I yeah. have really enjoyed what New Mexico has done this season. They do have a win in Sacramento this season. Back in July, they won 2-1. That was when New Mexico was maybe playing their best soccer of the season. Can they dial that back up? Hmm. See, for me, the play is the total. The I figure there's going to be goals scored. I'd go with the over. The over at two and a half at minus 163, I'll go over. Yeah, I mean, it's not, not a whole lot of a number there, so I'm going to stay away from that. I'm going New Mexico to win in regulation, and I will take, you know, the uh, the the candy bar, the crackle candy bars? Yeah. That you can't yeah. actually buy like as a full-size candy bar? They only have the the fun size version of it actually you've got to be in the right drugstore it's like finding razzles i've there, never it is. ever seen a full-size crackle bar in my life when i when i find one the thing is is though i find them not in metropolitan areas it, oh, literally yeah. it has to be small towns and things in the small town grocery stores that's where i find them never seen them um, I'll take the crackles that you get out of the fun size grab bag and, and throw those on New Mexico United. Okay. I was going to go with uh, Sacramento just because of home field advantage more than anything else, but my play was going to be the total and go ahead and just go over because of the firepower that we've seen from New Mexico United this year. And they've been a fun watch at the lab. I mean, they've been a fun watch period. So I think that there are going to be a lot of goals in this one, and it's going to be USL championship after dark. But I think Sacramento gets it done. Yeah, I think there's a very good chance for USL championship after dark. Let's take MLS and see if we get any MLS Cup playoffs after dark. New, New York City hosting Toronto. It's tonight, 7 o'clock from City Field. We've seen the pictures of what the pitch looks like in City Field. It looks about like the same size as it is in Yankee Stadium. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I, honestly, and in some ways, I think it looks a little bit better. I think just the layout looks a little bit better. It might look a little bit better on TV. Um, I really don't remember how the, the 2017 Decision Day match looked like at City Field. Um, we were a little busy at the Benz on Decision Day in 2017, so I didn't get a chance to I remember. Really watch that one straight up. Mm -hmm. um, it just looks like the, the way that the, the stands are arranged, it, it might have a little bit better look than sometimes the matches look like from Yankee Stadium. That's all superficial stuff. Who wins tonight is the question. Um, Josie Altador, big question mark. Omar Gonzalez, question mark. They didn't play in the first game of the playoffs. Toronto won. Now they go to face an NYC team that does have Eber available, but they don't know if he's going to start or not. Hmm. Everybody else appears to be ready to go for New York City. This season, out of two matches, Toronto took four points. Can they beat New York City? What do the candy purveyors think? Full-time result, 
and we have uh, we can go all the way through to method of victory here. So we've got okay. we've got a good dossier. NYCFC minus one eighteen, Toronto FC and the draw option in full time are at plus two eighty. Method of victory, extra time, NYCFC is plus nine hundred. Extra time, Toronto FC plus fourteen hundred. And that's the same in penalties for both sides, plus 1,400 for both NYCFC and Toronto. To qualify, bet 365, NYCFC minus 200, Toronto FC plus 150. Yeah, I mean, that's it should be. Uh, New York City is the better team. But there's the question because Toronto has handled them pretty well. Um. Both teams were missing pieces in those games. New York City especially. So, there's so many unknowns in this one. That's what makes it so hard. There's so many unknowns when you get to this point. Where's your gut taking you on it? I'm going to grab the Almond Joys and the Mounds Bars from the uh, the, the packet of the, the multi- the, like the mini, the mini multi packet in the plastic that you get for like thirteen dollars at Target, and I'm going to go Toronto in extra time. I'll take that fourteen hundred. Wow, are are you doing that just because it's a nice big number? Do you doing that because you don't like mounds and almond joys? I'm doing it because I don't like mounds and almond joys. Oh, that's a problem right there. But. I just I just think that much like the the boogeyman for tomorrow night out west, I think that Toronto just has NYCFC's number. I really do. I don't think that that I don't think it's going to happen in ninety minutes. I think it happens in extra time. Two one, Toronto FC, and I'll take the plus fourteen hundred. But I guess I'm protecting myself by putting the mounds on Almond Joy out there. New York City, 8-1-2 and two in their final 11 regular season matches. They haven't played since Decision Day. They did play a behind-closed-doors scrimmage slash friendly with the Chicago Fire or what was left of the Chicago Fire last week. I have no idea who they fielded. Was that a Schweinsteiger testimonial behind closed doors? Behind closed doors, no. That was not a Schweinsteiger testimonial. That was... Uh, Probably some academy kids, probably a few other guys. It was, okay, who wants to play? Cool, let's go play. It, it was not a real match. So did it actually help? Who knows? We'll have to see. Um, New York City should win this. They're a better team. They're, they're the better team than Toronto. Is Toronto in their head? I don't think it's like... El Trafico. I don't think it's no. a, a boogeyman situation. I don't think Toronto has done what the Galaxy have done to LAFC. I just I I don't think that's it. Um there's so many questions with, with Toronto. So Greg Vanny spoke after training on Monday. Chris Mavinga, Marky Delgado will be fit to play according to what Vanny said following training Monday. They did have to leave training early due to undisclosed injuries picked up in the match against D.C. Gonzalez at center back is probable tonight. Josie out the door. It doesn't look good because he didn't make the 18 on Saturday. Is he going to be maybe the last emergency substitution in extra time is, is he the, you're looking at is he the in case of emergency break glass in the 18 i don't think he can be much more than that i just i really don't so with all of that in flux i don't think toronto can win this i think nyc wins it if they don't i think nyc has blown the opportunity i really do i think they should win they're healthier. They're the better team. They should be able to take care of business. Where they could struggle is what you see so many times in these situations where teams who have that extended layoff 
come in and play a team that just played a few days before. Yeah, they're going to have more fatigue. And if it goes to extra time, then you absolutely favor New York City. But the team that played on the weekend is going to be in more rhythm. New York City is going to struggle to get their rhythm. And they're a rhythm kind of team. So I think New York City finds a way to get this done. But I think it might be a little bit of a wild ride. And I'm going NYC in extra time. I think they win it. I think Eber becomes a key when he comes in because I don't think he starts. I think he comes in later in the match. I'll throw... Hmm. What am I going to throw on this? Because I'm not 100% guaranteed on this. It's not a uh, velvet driving shoes lock of the week by any stretch. It's more like the... uh, hmm. Like the Milk Duds. I don't really like... Not a big fan of the milk duds. No, um, not a milk dud guy either. I'll throw the box of milk duds on it. Okay. I think NYC wins an extra time. I think they should. If they don't, there's going to be some really big time serious questions about how they didn't do it. Yeah. So so I'll stick with my uh, chewy coconut, mounds and almond joy, Toronto FC extra time. Well, whatever mounds you throw on it. I steal them and eat them. That's what I'm going to do. All right, okay. West Coast, Seattle, RSL, 10 o'clock tonight. It's on FS1, both games, FS1 tonight. Seattle comes in after a wild, crazy shootout against FC Dallas where Seattle Blue leads. Got it done in the end. Jordan Morse with a hat trick. Real Salt Lake comes in. Late winner from Jefferson Savarino. Joel Plata was involved in doing that off the bench, creating that opportunity. Portland made it very difficult in the second half. Didn't really show up in the first half. Giovanni Savarese is still looking for him in the first 45 minutes. Now can RSL go and keep Nick Raimondo's career alive for another week? I think they can. I don't... Seattle doesn't... Seattle doesn't feel like a dominant number two seed here. Yeah. They... For me, Seattle doesn't feel like Atlanta feels like against Philadelphia. Atlanta feels like a much stronger position as the two against the three than Seattle does. Some of it is down to blowing the leads that they blew. Some of it is down to defensively Seattle's had issues for a long time. And some of it's down to RSL, who is just a a very good, balanced team. They have some outstanding players, but it's a very balanced team group and I do think you do have a little bit of the momentum and the the motivation of we want to do this for for Nikki we want to keep Raimondo with us as long as we possibly can and he's still at this point a goalkeeper who can make a difference and you saw it against Portland it was massive in the second half this feels like a massive toss up tonight I could see it going either way what do the candy purveyors think? This then this may interest you. I figured it would. With with your thought pattern going into these particular results, remember these are just courtesy of our friends at Bet Three Six Five. They're probably close to the mean when it comes to what everybody's thinking across the board. Seattle full time minus one fifty. RSL full time plus four hundred. The draw, plus 275. Extra time, Seattle plus 850. RSL extra time, plus 1800. And both teams plus 1400 in penalties to qualify Seattle minus 300, RSL plus 225. Hmm. Where are you going with? I'll ta- I'll uh, I'll steal the the mounds back that you're trying to steal from me from the no, previous you game. No, you put it on something. You don't get to put it on something else. You already put it on one. Well, it's more than a bag. It's like a more than just two in a bag. Oh, get creative. Pick something else. Fine. I'll take I'll take the Kit Kats and go RSL extra time. The Canadian Kit Kats or the American Kit Kats? No, American Kit Kats. Not 
Yeah, no, because if, if it was, I should, what I should have done was sit there and say that I was going to put arrow bars on uh, Toronto FC. That's what I should have said. Yeah, but American Kit Kats on RSL in extra time at plus eighteen hundred. Now, are you doing that because you don't like Kit Kats, or because you you really believe in RSL in extra time? I really believe in RSL in extra time. Win one for Nikki. Hmm. Hmm. Just the 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 issues defensively for Seattle uh, set itself up for. Uh, a, a Demir Crylock shot from just outside the box from about 20. And then probably something from Severino in transition to put something into the middle. And uh, I think it's probably going to end up being something along the lines of 2-1 extra time RSL. All right. I feel pretty good about this one. I'm going to go with Rail Salt Lake in regulation in a shootout. But I think RSL gets the win. This is this is the one where you go to the house and you've already went to you know a few different houses. You said trick or treat. You got some candy thrown in the bag. You got the uh, the little gold wrapper Reese's peanut butter cups. You know the little ones. You get some of those. Like oh, it's cool. Oh, the, good. The individual ones. The the little gold ones. The little little yeah. small ones. You get some of those. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Okay. Good score. But then you go to the house and, and you get the full size cup. Yeah, it's the individual like normal size Reese's peanut butter cup, and it's like yes, taking that on RSL and regulation. I just don't think Seattle nice. can defend well enough. Yeah, and that to me has been the, the biggest the biggest thing in, in any consideration looking at Seattle advancing. But uh, yeah, I'm looking for uh, I'm looking for MLS after dark out in Seattle. I think it'll be uh, I think it'll be intriguing. Yeah, I think it'll deliver with the after darkness of it. It'll be, it, it could be very stupid because you got two teams that can score goals and you got one that doesn't defend all that well. And RSL is actually a pretty good defensive team. So I just, I think they have the advantage here. I don't think they're afraid of going into Seattle. I, I don't think it's a, a super intimidating spot for RSL. I think it's a spot that in, in some ways has a lot of meaning to the club. It's where they won their MLS Cup when they beat the LA Galaxy in a penalty shootout. So I, there's there's a lot of things going on in this one that, that lead me to RSL knocking off Seattle and pulling the upset. Over under at two and a half. The overs at minus 138. The under at plus 107. Yeah, that's what I thought. All right. There's your picks. USL Championship and M- us for entertainment purposes only, of course, of course, yes. of course. Um, yes. Let us know what you think. Tweet at us at soccer down here. We'll get into the wall pass Wednesday timeline right after this. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update! I'm gonna let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. This is what matters. This is beyond X's and O's. This is the difference mutual respect makes. This is what character looks like. This is what defines us in Georgia. This is sportsmanship. School sports, it's not the outcome that matters most, but the way the games are played. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 
at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. Welcome back. Soccer down here. October 23rd, MLS Cup playoffs return. USL Championship playoffs get started. It's a busy night around the American soccer scene. What questions do you listeners have this morning? ATL UTD fan number one has predictions. Okay. Going with a 3-2 Toronto win at the death in the 94th minute over NYCFC. That's very specific. Yeah. And complete with the hashtags that give you the logos and stuff. So it's like yeah, that's hashtag normal. TFC live and it gives you the, the TFC logo pops up. Hashtag unite and conquer. And the nightcap hashtag Sounders match day over hashtag RSL 2-1. Hashtag wall pass Wednesday. See, there, there's some of the hashtags that give you the logos. I mean, that's that's a cool thing. It's very cool when you get these partnerships with Twitter and you do that. I mean, you had Boca and River. If you did hashtag Boca or River, you got the little logo. But some of them are just like Sounders match day. Like, no. Like that, no. Be something about the Sounders, whatever your catchphrase like is. Like hashtag or, rave green or something like that. I mean, if you want to. I, I think that's whatever anyway, but... Whatever you want to do, like do something like that. Don't do TFC Live or Sounders Mash Day. That that sounds like a rock concert. No, it just sounds show. dumb. It has, no, it has nothing to do with any of that. It just sounds dumb. Like it's not supposed to be that. The hashtag is supposed to be some, you know, expression of your team, whether it's Unite and Conquer or just whatever. Like Face of City, I think was Orlando's. Mm-hmm, okay, whatever. Um, really, but. It could just be, you know, OCSC, whatever your def- your abbreviation yep. is, whatever. It but is. Not Sounders Match Day or TFD Live. That's like a hashtag just for game updates. That's goofy. Yeah. Come on, guys. Yep. Hashtag face of city. And it yeah, is the, or- that is the Orlando was. City pop-up. Yes. I, I didn't, I'd never seen that one. Yes. You don't pay attention to my tweets on game days because I do the... The emoji tweet with the, all the, the particulars for the radio broadcast, and I go through and find the hashtag for each of the teams to get their logo to pop up. And face of city, it's face of city, I guess. I mean, I guess it's better than face of not making the playoffs. That doesn't fit in a hashtag. That's too much. Um, it's better than in the hunt, which was their playoff slogan that they didn't get to use. <laughs> no. Oh. Oh, goodness gracious. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't get to use that one. They did, but it didn't last very long. No, it disappeared. It it has no uh, logo behind it. Jorge B. says that the new playoffs format is exciting, but what are your thoughts on possibly changing the current league format to an Apertura from July to December and a Clausura from January to May? each with its own playoffs and two champions are crowned each season, then having a uh, Campiones Cup, hashtag Wall Pass Wednesday. I'm not against it. I, I don't think it will happen because I feel like MLS wants to make things as simple as possible. Um, from a competitive standpoint, I kind of like it. You have to then make the decision, and, and different countries have gone about it in different ways, about how do you define your champion is that you have two champions you have an apertura and a clausura champion or do you have an apertura season a clausura season then the winners face off in a match that is to determine your league champion it it, it sounds like semantics but it, it becomes an issue in some countries where the amount of league championships you've won is a very important distinction Argentina had battles about do Copa de Superliga Cup tournaments. Do they count as league championships? Because teams get very argumentative about we have this many league championships. We have more than you. No, you don't. You have cup championships. Blah, blah, blah. Rabble, rabble, rabble. So you'd have to make that decision. 
I think it's better if you have two separate champions like Mexico does in that regard, and like most leagues do. And that's what Argentina went to when they did that format eventually to stop the fighting. Um, you do have the opportunity then to have a, a Campeon de Campeones match where it's, it's almost like a Super Cup within your country, which is kind of cool. I I don't have a problem with that at all. I think more than let, let's let's leave the the formatting out for a second. I do think that that type of calendar is going to end up being one that I could see MLS adopting in some way. You look at at Mexico and how they do it. Now they do an Apertura Clausura, but the way their calendar runs makes a lot of sense when you start to get into international breaks, when you start to get into everything with, you know, the summer window and having competitions going on. I want to pull this up real quick and give you an idea of what the calendar has looked like in the last year. So, Because I have a question as well, now that you're mentioning all this For 1920, for this current season that they're in the apertura started on july 19th and it will end let me see if they've got the dates for what the finals look like yet i don't think they do um hold on one second let me see if i can find it because this is important and no they don't have it structured yet so You'll have your playoffs in Mexico with your top eight. Let me go back to last year so we get a sense of it here. Okay, here we go. So 2018-19, the Apertura will start, you know, mid-July. The playoffs, the second leg of the final in the Apertura was played on December 13th. So basically around the time that last year's MLS Cup was. They went to that. Um, Actually, that was first leg. The second leg was December 16th, so a week later. A week after MLS Cup last year. So that was the the format for the Apertura. Now, the Klausura, which would be the start of the MLS year, since they go by the calendar year, not by the fall to spring... It started, well, do we have a start date? January 4th, and the season ended on May 26th. Then, let me see if May 26th was the final or the end of the regular season. It was the final. So May 26th was the second leg of the final for that season. So you're looking at a season, if you take it to MLS calendar, that would start in... January, which would be a, a big departure from what we've had and will be very difficult in the calendar that MLS faces with weather. But then their final ended into May. Then they had June and a half of July off. Then they started the Apertura. So they, the Klausura Apertura in the same calendar year, but they look at it as Apertura Klausura opening, closing. That summer break, I think, is an important thing that would, if MLS could get to it, it'd be great. It might be hard because of Mexico being able to start their season in early January. You have very few MLS teams that can host games in early January. So it might be hard to condense it into that. Now, remember, you don't have playoffs in the first half of the season in MLS. Jorge B would not be happy about the Apertura Clausura idea with that, but... Let's say they don't go to that and it's just the the MLS season, but you want to incorporate that summer break for tournaments and for just not playing in the stupid heat because there's teams that have to play games right now in ridiculous heat that has a huge impact on the match. It It's doable in the way that Mexico does it where you avoid the FIFA dates. You do play all the way into where MLS has been playing in recent years that MLS wanted to get away from because of weather concerns. I think there's things to learn from it. I don't know if they could truly adopt that calendar or that format. I think it'd be really 
tricky because of some of the weather. I just that's, that's what's going to complicate it. My question for you then, let's just say if we went to an Apertura Clausura, how do you think that would impact who qualifies for CONCACAF Champions League? Well, Mexico has qualification for CONCACAF Champions League, so you do the same thing, essentially. Um, you just follow what they do. I, I think in theirs, let's pull it so we're sure, because I can't remember how they do the Copa MX spots when it comes to CONCACAF Champions League. Because Mexico does two cups alongside the league play. So they have an Apertura, Clausura, Copa MX, which really makes it complicated. But, yeah. hey, they've got deeper squads. A lot of those games you're playing you know, second choice, sometimes third choice. Triple-digit dudes. Yeah, I mean, it happens. It's part of the, part of the process. So let's pull up the 2020 CONCACAF Champions League qualification. Mexico, actually the cup teams don't have nothing to do with it. So it's just your Apertura winners, your Clausura winner, your Apertura runner-up, your Clausura runner-up. That's it. Very simple. Um, if there's a double, I guess they go to overall record over the two seasons. I'd have to double check that. But yeah, you would do something like that. Now, if you did it for MLS and there's four seeds, four spots, um, you would have your your two champions go, your Open Cup winner go, and then maybe your best overall record that doesn't hasn't earned a spot yet. Maybe that would be how you do it. Yeah, that was kind of what I was I was trying to figure out. That would be my decree if if we did okay. that. It's you're right. not going to do an Apertura Clausura in the United States. I I think you could. I think it'd be very compelling. I think it'd be exciting. Um, do it with playoffs on the back end of each one. I'm cool with it. I think it'd be great. My sense is that MLS is trying to make things easier for your average sports fan to understand, and I can just see some of the people on Sports Center have very snide comments about the format. And I don't know if it's worth the confusion. I mean, if they were worried about people not understanding two leg aggregate, which yeah. I think was a concern, it was unfounded. I mean, I think people got it pretty quickly. Uh, I, I just don't think they go to it. From a soccer perspective, I'd be absolutely cool with it. I just don't think MLS ever does it. I really don't. Let's see. Uh, Tafka has something about his Opus system, which I think probably we can go in the second hour with. And oh, Eric the Engler Opus is has... alive. Yep. So, yeah, Tafka had an Opus system uh, idea and comparison question, and Eric Englert had a question as well. Cool. We'll get into those in hour number two. Um, along with some other news and notes, some rumor slash updates out of New Jersey when it comes to the manager of the New York Red Bulls, also a retirement from the Red Bull squad. FIFA might be investing more in the women's game. We'll talk about what is on the table for their meeting tomorrow and what they might approve, along with anything else that pops up over the next hour. Hang out with us. We'll be right back after this. Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student-athletes right here in Georgia. High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders. It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen, following directions, accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky & Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today 
at steve at aa-legal.com or call in 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company. Bloomington, Illinois. You're listening to Soccer Down Here Daily on SDH Networks, a division of OSG Sports. Find us at Soccer Down Here on Facebook and Twitter. The time is now the top of the hour. Peep, y'all. Welcome back. Hour number two, SDH, October 23rd. Getting ready for a busy day on the eve of Atlanta and Philadelphia. Tomorrow night at Mercedes Benz Stadium. Kickoff will be after 8 o'clock. I think it's around 8.15. I might be mistaking it, but I think it's around 8.15. It's not the crazy like 8.30 after an 8 o'clock, but it's a little bit later than the usual 8.08 after an an 8 o'clock advertised time. One day they'll just say when the kickoff time is. One day it'll happen. Yeah, really? Um, one day people will be in their seats at the <laughs> announced kickoff time, let alone the time it actually kicks off, because that doesn't happen much either. Uh, welcome to Atlanta. It happens. I think the later kick, though, will help with that. I think being yeah. an, an eight advertised kick is good. The sevens are tough with Atlanta traffic. Yes. The eight, a little more manageable. So I, I think that will work pretty well. It's a big game with uh, a lot of... On the line, obviously, and I think a lot will be needed from the fans in the stands. The 17s will need to make some noise because, you know, if things go to chalk, then this is the last game at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in 2019. So, you know, you'll you'll know going in because NYC plays tonight. If NYC wins, the Eastern Conference Final will be in New York at Yankee Stadium. It'll be back at Yankee Stadium since the Yankees didn't get to the World Series. If Toronto wins, then whoever wins tomorrow night will be hosting the Eastern Conference Final. Could ratchet up the uh, intensity. Just another little extra notch, which I think this one's going to be a wild one anyway. I think it's going to be a very, very intense match. We'll get into the tactics a little bit in the next segment when you look at what Philadelphia has been doing lately along with what Atlanta can do without Michael Parkhurst without Miles Robinson, who were announced as being out for the match by Frank DeBoer yesterday. A couple other programming notes today. Uh, I'll be on with Andy and Randy on the midday show at 1240, a little bit different time today. Um, Hawks getting ready to kick off their season tomorrow. That match will be on V or that game will be on V103 tomorrow night. Atlanta United will be on 92.9 the game. Keep that in mind. If you're looking for both, um, two o'clock stoppage time will be from the 92.9 The Game Studios. Myself and Mike Conti will be on that one. Jimmy Vance will not be joining us today because after that's done, I'll be heading up to Sandy Springs to Stars and Strikes for the Celebrity Rock and Jock Bowling Tournament. There you put go. Put on by 92.9 The Game. Um, And actually, thanks to our good friend Jimmy Vance, if there is anyone out there listening who would like to participate and bowl with me because I need all the help I can get because my bowling skills, one, are not very well practiced, and two, were never that good to begin with. Um, If anybody wants to come out, yeah. But golf, I I feel like I could get to an acceptable level. Uh, Bowling, I never really found an acceptable level. I used to be a 150 bowler. I used to do the Saturday morning bowling league when I was a kid. Yeah. And and actually got to being a consistent 130 to 150. Now, not so much. No. I don't know. I was about to say, well, maybe you need to break out the bowling shoes. but No, no, no. No, no. You'd be a whole lot of help. No, so I'm if not, there are not, any not, folks out there listening who can who can join us, you got to be there, and it's, this is the tricky part. So it's it's kind of a, a a hopeful option here because we've had a couple of spots open up. Send me a message 
on Twitter at Longshoe and, and let me know if you can do it. You have to be able to be there by three o'clock. That's when sign in starts. The actual bowling will start at four. So shoot me a message. We've got some spots. Let me know if you can participate. Uh, it's for a great cause. It's for the Travis Mannion Foundation. Um, really excited that that ninety two nine and and the the whole family of Intercom Atlanta stations are coming together for a great cause like the Travis Mannion Foundation. So today, if you can bowl with us, come hang out. My plan is one to probably stink at bowling because I'm just not very good at it. Good plan. Uh, Hopefully I can be decent and hopefully uh, whatever team that we put together can can compete for a trophy and compete for prizes, actually. Uh, there are also some very cool raffle items, raffle and auction items from the station. I know an autographed item from Tito Vialba will be Ooh. on hand along with stuff from the Falcons and the Hawks and other Atlanta area sports and just businesses. It's going to be a very cool fundraiser for the Travis Mannion Foundation. But I'm going to hang out and watch New York and Toronto from up there. That's my plan. So Stars and Strikes, Sandy Springs, if you can make it, shoot me a message. Let me know. Come out and bowl and bowl for a good cause. And we'll uh, we'll see if we can not stink. How about that? There you go. Uh, tomorrow, when it comes to our pregame, do you have any ideas about that yet? Okay, so tomorrow, um, here's what I know so far about my day. It, it will start at 7 o'clock a.m. on the morning show with John Fricky and Hugh Douglas. Yep. Early call. Early, early call. Early. So we'll do that. We'll have our game day soccer down here preview with Mike Conti and Doug Robertson joining us tomorrow morning from 9 to 11. We will have our tailgate show presented by Apolinsky and Associates. Uh, timing's tricky because 3:30? it's midweek. No, not that early because it's an eight o'clock kick. Um, but I need to be in the building a little earlier than normal with everything going on. So four right. thirty okay. is the plan. Um for the tailgate show in the Gulch with our friends, the faction and presented by Apolinsky and associates. And if you can't join us, it will be available on something depending on the connections we can get yes, out of connectivity. the Gulch. Yeah. Uh, the Gulch is not a prime spot for connectivity. It will hopefully be on Twitter um, as it was, as I did the show this weekend from the Krispy Kreme parking lot. Hey, the hot light was on. I had to stop. Oh, what, what I was going to say, what donuts did you get? Um, I went with just the glazed because the hot light was on, and you got to do See, that. See, hot donuts now, you have to pull over. You have to. And they had a uh, a chocolate-filled one where, like, it's the oh. donut. It's not like a – it's not a normal-filled donut. It, it's like a round with a hole in the middle donut, and it had the chocolate cream in the middle. And the reason I got it is they had stripes on the front of it. And I was like, well, I'm going to the Atlanta United game. I should probably have a donut with stripes on it. I can't pass that up. So that's that's what I did. And they had good connectivity. Hopefully, we get good yes, connectivity from the Gulch on a, tomorrow afternoon. We'll see. If not, then you'll be able to listen to it here on the SDH network on your app and on at SoccerDownHere.net and on Spreaker. Yes. But we will point you what in you the right say. direction uh, around 430. Yes. When we know what uh, connectivity yields. Yes. Let's get back into All right. the Twitters. All right. The Opus system from Tafka. He says, my Opus system is not the simplest by far. No, it is, it is not the simplest. <laughs> no, and I'm concerned. <laughs> when it's an Opus, that, it ain't simple. Yeah. No, when is an Opus ever simple? Op, o, 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 opuses? Opi? <laughs> opuses. It, opuses, they are never simple. No. I kind of want it to be Opi, though, because that's just awesome. Well, okay, so then fine. Tafka's, Tafka, when he submits his systems, ha- sends us Opi. He does not send us Opuses. <laughs> we call them Opi around here. Yeah, we do. He's concerned that as the league grows, we'll be left with strictly a regular season with only, in all capital letters, conference play. That idea puts a terrible taste in my mouth. I think that's going to happen. What I don't know thoughts? where that's coming from, Tafka. I don't know what's what scared you. 
other than than Mike's idea about East West, and I saw Arlo White kind of jumped on that as too with uh, the baseball idea of National League, American League, limited interleague play. Um, I don't think MLS goes to strictly conference play because I don't think MLS ever wants to lose out on the on the New York Los Angeles regular season matches. I think they have no interest in losing out on that. So yeah, you lose your top two TV markets going against each other and getting ratings out of both. Yeah, I mean, yes, but it's just the idea of New York and Los Angeles. I mean, it's it's a big deal when the awful Knicks play the Lakers. It's always a big deal, and then the Knicks are terrible. So if you get NYC in the Galaxy or NYC in LAFC or the Red Bulls, yes, they're Jersey, but it's close enough. And the Galaxy or Red Bulls and, and LAFC, it, it has a little bit of extra oomph. So I don't think they're going to want to get away from that. I don't know how they structure it. And I guess the biggest unknown for me is, is there a limitation on how many regular season matches they want to have? I mean, I, I, I'm sure there's a, a cap somewhere, but is it 34? Or would they be willing, if the format calls for it, to go to 36 or 38, add a couple more home games? Would they go that direction? Or do they feel like, well, maybe we come back a little bit because we're going to add another game in the Open Cup. We're going to add the League's Cup for a lot of teams. Teams are already playing in CONCACAF. Are you going to come back the other way? I don't think you come backwards. I think that would be a bad move if they did. You'd have to... The only way that makes sense is if everybody is participating in whatever the League's Cup ends up being in terms of true interconnected play on a regular basis between MLS and Mexico, and I don't think you're anywhere near that right now. I think the only way that happens is if Mexico either streamlines or eliminates the Copa MX and then not do two of them. They'd have to only do one like we do the Open Cup. Do it in the Open Cup type of format, not a group stage with a bunch of extra games. And MLS would probably have to cut back on the number of games just a little bit. I don't think any of that's happening anytime soon. So I don't think you're going below 34 games. I could see a scenario now with so many teams controlling their own venues to go to 36 or to go to 38 and add a couple yeah. more home games because I think teams are making money on home games now for the most part around the league as opposed to paying a million dollars in rent for the building for the day and not being able to make that back. And, you know, you don't want to have extra home games if you can help it. So I think there's probably more of a business case to add games, which – yeah, can give you more flexibility in the the formatting. But I don't think you ever get to where you're only playing the teams in the East or only playing the teams in the West, or if you rearrange the conferences, you're only playing the teams in your conference. I think it's probably more likely that you go to three conferences. I think that type of format is more likely than limited interconference play. Yeah, because, I mean, if you're doing... If you go to th- if you're at 32 teams, let's say when that day comes, let's say th- let's start with 30 because they've said 30, right, so 30. They haven't moved that yet. Let's let's say right, so you add 30. whoever you go to 30. All right, so 30. If you split that in half, you got 15 and 15. If you're in your conference, 14 home and aways puts you at 28. Not doing that. That's no because that's the, the, how how does that work? And that's what I'm saying. It's like, then do you play what half of the half no. of the other teams in the conference? Rotate no. that out on a yeah. No. See, I don't think you do that. I think you go to, and this is spitballing. I've not done the math, so we'll see if I'm in the ballpark. You go to three conferences of ten. You play home and away in your conference. That's eighteen, 18. and then you're playing the other teams, which is twenty once. That's thirty eight. And that's rotate 90. home and away each year. That's what you with do each of those others, so right that puts now. you at thirty. So yeah. It's yeah. no different. You just go into three conferences instead of two, and you're adding four more games. That feels okay in the yeah. the current world of MLS without big revisions to the way things are formatted. That seems to be the easiest option. Um, now, if you go to thirty-two teams, and we're talking about a different scenario, then you're probably looking at 
what four team conferences? Four four by eight. Yeah, or divisions in conferences, and then it gets a little trickier. So, I mean, it's still doable, but so what would that math be? You're playing the seven in your division, we'll say, for 14, then you're playing everybody else, which would be what? 24. 24, so that gets you to? 38. Same number. Okay, so that can work too. So there's your solution in the simplest of formats. Done! simple format the, now if you want to read if you want to revise it if you want to reimagine it this would be the time to do it but if you want to basically keep it the way it is i think you got to go to 38 games to make that work yeah eric englert for wall pass wednesday hashtag wall pass wednesday sorry in honor of fifa 20 if you could maximize the stats of just one player to their full potential Only for the game against Philly, who are you picking and why? Not meaning the in-game numbers, just the hypothetical max potential. That's a good one. Um, Hmm. See, now I don't know the... So uh, you're only increasing it to the max potential. So you're not going to be able to make like any player just a superstar maxed out on every type of characteristic. Okay. So you got to think about somebody playing their absolute best. And if you're not a, a FIFA person, we'll put it in those terms for you. So you can pick any player to play the best game of their career, their, the best that they can possibly play. Not that you turn, you know, Kevin Kratz into Pelé. It's you, you, that player can play the best game that they can possibly play. Hmm. Leandro gonzalez Pires. Okay. Because I think the back line is going to be so critical here, and you need him to have the day. You need him to have the biggest day he can have because he's going to have to not just be good defensively, but there's a very good chance he's going to be in much more of an organizational kind of role. I think he's critical, and I think if he has that kind of day, Atlanta wins, and they go to the Eastern Conference Final. If he has a rough day... I think it's going to be very hard to overcome. If he has a good day, just a good day, okay, you're you're fine. You, other players can step up and do that, but he's critical. I think he becomes even more critical without Robinson and Parker. So that's where I'm going. I think the rest of the guys, you've got enough talent to outplay Philadelphia however they play, but you're going to need someone on the back line to step up and have that kind of day, that kind of day that we talk about for years to come. And that would be the player that I think can have the biggest impact. Yeah. No, I'm right there with you. I mean, I was, because I don't play FIFA 20 because I'd probably lose a lot. I'd be like Brandon Vasquez quality FIFA 20 at last report. And for me, I on Brandon Vasquez's FIFA skills in a couple of years. Maybe he's improved. Maybe. Um, I I think Brandon Vasquez would, would wax you all over the field. Oh, I'm sure he would. I'll stipulate to that in a heartbeat. But, you know, for me, if you're looking at the guys up top, all you're doing is topping off a number. You know, because if you pick somebody who's, if you pick Zeke or if you pick PT or if you pick uh, Joseph, they're already close to being maxed out anyway. So you need to have somebody who would be, who's someone who's got some room. And I was thinking along those same lines with you about LGP. And I was also trying to process guys like, Pogba and Escobar I wasn't thinking or Jeff Lorenowitz I was I wasn't thinking about the midfield or the front I was thinking about those in front of Brad I think that's where you're going to need your biggest performances and and, uh, according to Tafka he says remaining opi are being saved for the offseason too much going on midseason and playoffs he said oh but he says it's going to blow your mind though yeah that's build up that's build they up. They have. I mean, the, you're you're talking about reimagining things. So yeah, generally that that is mind blowing. Um, the question and and anytime the stuff comes up, I I love the the attempts to reimagine it because I I hope MLS is listening to this type of stuff. It doesn't mean they have to take it word for word. It doesn't mean they have to take every bit of it. But you're at a point now where. You know, look, we went through the easy way, and that's the simplest way. And if you want to keep things the way they are and and just add more teams, 
that's probably the way you're going to have to do it. There's not another way with two conferences or, or whatever to make it work. But you have the opportunity to do it in a completely different way than anybody else in the world does it and a completely different way than you've done it if you want to take it. And this is probably the last time to truly take it and make it work. So I, I hope they're listening. I, I hope people understand where I'm coming from on it. Like, I think MLS doesn't want to go out there on some of these ideas and their format because I think they feel like they have to make it simple for people to understand. I don't think they're giving their audience enough credit. I think people will grab onto something that's a little different. I think it's an opportunity where you can set yourself apart from not the other soccer leagues in the world, but the other sports leagues in the United States in the way that you format your competition. I think it's something that they could take advantage of if they hit on the right solution, if they get the right idea and make it work in their world. It's risky. It's not likely. I think the most likely thing is it's probably what we went through in terms of three conferences and then four, if it's two divisions in each conference or whatever it looks like in two conferences, whatever it goes to, if it's 30 teams or 32, you have a pretty simple way to scale up. Now, the question, and I've always said this, is if you get to 30, and right now you're looking at Team 30 being a race between Charlotte and Phoenix, probably. It's probably the two that are in front of this, although there's others who are in the mix. Those are the two that are the, the most out in front. Do you want to stop at 30 and only take one of them instead of going ahead and saying, well, you know what? We're in a position. We'll go to 32. You take Phoenix, you take Charlotte, you take one more. If that gives San Diego more time to be what we think they all, that we all think they could be. If that gives Vegas more time to put something together. If that gives Raleigh more time to continue to mature and build their stadium up. If that gives a Louisville city more yeah. time to continue to grow and build onto their stadium that they're building. And they'll have the NWSL team starting in 21. That's not out of the realm of possibility. It could give Indy 11 time to find the right situation for them. It could give Detroit time. You can go to 32 pretty comfortably if you want to. I think the teams and the interest is there. Then you get to that question of, is that where you're going to stop? Or are you going to look at an MLS 1 and an MLS 2 and really change your format up? And really blow it up? Or are you going to let U.S. Soccer, and more importantly in this case, USL Championship, grow that second division and continue growing it? Reports out there from our friends at Sock Takes are that the expansion fee for USL Championship is now $10 million. I mean, you go back 10 years and almost given teams away. And now it's $10 million bucks to get into the USL Championship. USL League One, it's, it's a good bit less than that. That's why USL League One will, will start to grow here with smaller markets. But does MLS want to be everything in the first and second divisions or a Premier League and a first division, however the, yeah. you know, they look at it? Do they want to partner or work with or whatever it ends up being with USL in this? I know there's lots of people out there with black helicopters out in front and tin foil hats back in the back that are looking at, well, USL can now say we're going to be the first division and we're going to grow and be that. I, I don't see that happening, but does USL want more than it currently is? It makes sense. It's an ambitious league. It's done very, very well. What does that look like? You're going to get to those questions very soon. You, you're probably honestly, you're probably getting to all of those questions right now at the top top levels of, you know, policy makers and and strategy makers. You're going to get to the logistics portion of it once MLS announces team number thirty, because then MLS has to be definitive in, in what they say about. We're going to go to 32 because the interest is there, and that's what we're going to do right now. 
or we're going to stay here at this number for right now, and that's it. I think they say they're going to go to 32 at that point because I think it's going to be hard to walk away from Charlotte or Phoenix or a revitalized San Diego or the rest of the ones we've talked about. People want to cut you a check. You're going to say no. I think it's hard to. And then the more that you say yes to that, where does that fit for USL? Because you're going to start to talk about either USL championship teams wanting to cut that check like we've seen here in recent years, or you're going to see people come in in USL championship markets to cut that check. And either way, USL, then it becomes a different conversation for them. And where do they want to be? And what's their growth pattern? Do they become the idea of, all right, go go do the big, top, high money, you go do that MLS. We're going to take lots of smaller markets and take less money, but lots of them, and be just fine. Because there's absolutely a market for that. I, I think mm-hmm. USL League One... When it grows, I can honestly see USL League One being between the championship and League Two in terms of a number of teams. I can see it being a 60-team league. I can see it being highly regionalized and uh, like the German third and fourth division where it is regional, you're playing you know, good competition, but you're not traveling all that far to do it, especially in the East, you're not. Out West, you're always going to have a little more travel. But it's going to be like four regional pods of 15, 16 teams. And you might not play outside of your region. At, at the D3 Pro level, I don't think you need to. I don't think there's any value in long-term Tormenta playing Tucson. I think there's more value in Tormenta playing Greenville and Tormenta playing Richmond and Tormenta playing, you know, Montgomery, Alabama or Asheville City or whatever. I think there's more value in that than a team from Arizona coming in. So I think League One for USL, they're sitting on a gold mine. I really think they can be in that regard because I think it can. There's no limit to the number of teams you can have. You just regionalize it and keep making pods, and there you go. Then you have a Final Four or Final Eight or whatever it ends up being, and that's where you have interregional play. But you can take those. If it's $10 million for USL Championship, I don't know what the expansion fee is for USL League One. If it's right now two or three, but gets to where it's in that five to ten region, you can take 50 of those. <laughs> you can have 50 expansion teams at League One because you have League Two as a proving ground in so many ways. That's where you get... MLS growth is very, very important because that's what people are, are going to gravitate to on TV. That's what's going to get national TV. That's what's going to bring big-name players in. USL Championship is a very important next layer for player development to have veteran players have somewhere to play as they either age out of MLS or didn't really want to be that 17th, 18th guy on the game day roster. They want to start and be in the starting lineup in USL Championship. They feel like that's the better spot for them. Cool. That's that's sports. That's great. USL Championship is very important. But I feel like USL League One is the untapped growth area for soccer in the United States. Because if you regionalize it and that keeps the travel budgets down, you're talking about how like minor league baseball exploded with the smaller regional leagues that lasted, I mean, still last today. And there's, there's talk about some really wild revisions of it, but you have historical leagues of minor league baseball that were super regionalized that were still very important in their local communities, very important in developing players in the long term, but also those clubs in their local community didn't feel minor league. That's really important. And I think League One, to me, that's the area that 
could have the biggest impact on soccer in the United States as a whole if it, if it grows correctly. Southern, South Atlantic, Appalachian, Midwest, and that's and New York Penn. Those are just the five off the top of my head in minor league baseball that have been around and have teams that have been around forever, and they are the absolute fabric of those towns that they're involved in. It's huge, and I think League One can be that, and League One can be a spot that you know you, you see it in other countries where you have a, a promising young player and you send them to a, a third division team to get their feet wet and to deal with that, those types of environments and playing in a in a rivalry match between Greenville and and Tormenta with traveling fans and the whole nine yards like yeah. that stuff that's important. If you're a kid coming out of the academy and then you go drop in from an academy game where there might be, you know, a hundred friends and family there with no atmosphere, the intensity's just on the field, to going into a, a League One intense match with three, four thousand people there, fans from both sides, and that's a that's preparing you for mm-hmm. the top flight. That's that's a big part of a player's development. I mean, David Beckham went to Preston North End on loan early on in his career, and that kind of helped get him ready to be what he was. It was a big part of his development. Alex Ferguson saw that he needed that type of challenge, and he, he grabbed it and took it and was a, a huge part in his short time with Preston North End. But those are the types of things that, I think League One really could end up being that very underrated element that raises soccer in the United States. And also from a business perspective, because it's all about the money. Mm -hmm. League One's a potential gold mine. I really think it could be. Ike Man. He says, I doubt it would ever happen, but I'd like to see a hybrid pro rel where the MLS teams stay up, but there are two to four at large lower division teams that can move up for a season. Thinking out loud before coffee. Hashtag wall pass Wednesday. Yeah. But see, that's where it gets into like crazy ideas that how do you sell that? It sounds fun. It, it's okay. Cool. A team gets to hop up for a season or two. Well, how do they hop back down? And what if they yeah. come up and have a great couple of years and yeah, really compete? Yeah. What if they're mid-table? Yeah. What if they're anything? I mean, like, how do you how do you set that up? Like, how do you judge? Do they have to have a playoff with with somebody to to stay up in the spot. Like, I, I it just it doesn't make a lot of logical sense. And then you, you do have to think about it because this does play into it. How are you going to explain that to an old school sports editor at the local newspaper who has to write about it, or you know, send somebody out to write about it? How did how do they wrap their head around it? I don't know if they can, because it's kind of weird. I mean, it, it's not a normal sporting setup. So I don't know if that would work because of that. I, I, th- those types of things like sound really interesting. I'm sure they could be very compelling, but selling it is really difficult, and that's part of this. Back to the FIFA 20 question. Michael Ruiz says that for him, it's Joseph Martinez, and it's not even close on max potential. I take his best potential every game. I like my chances still with our defense. Second pick would be Barco. Third would be Escobar because playoff Escobar. I think Martinez is pretty close to his max potential anyway. And and I think Barco is... Barco has like larger max potential to continue to grow as a player, but where he's at right now, I, I think he's playing as well as he possibly can. Like if they play the way that they currently play, and you get that person to step up in the back line, that's why I would go in that direction. Escobar, for whatever reason, the playoffs roll around and he hits that playoff max potential, and he needs to need it here again. I, I just I have more questions going into this on the back line because you're missing two key figures. Yeah. So you're going to have to get someone to step up and, and play in a way to make up for the absence of Robinson and Parkhurst. And we'll talk about why after a quick break, Philadelphia has a couple different ways to play and how they play will affect 
I think in some ways how Atlanta plays and you don't really know how Philly's going to come into this. So if you're Frank DeBoer, what do you choose based on what you think Philly might do? We'll talk about how Philly finished out the season, how they came out in their playoff match and what that could mean for tomorrow night right after this. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm gonna let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. This is what matters. This is beyond X's and O's. This is the difference mutual respect makes. This is what character looks like. This is what defines us in Georgia. This is sportsmanship. School sports, it's not the outcome that matters most, but the way the games are played. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. Welcome back. Soccer down here, October 23rd. Getting ready for the MLS Cup playoffs, conference semifinals tonight. New York City, Toronto, Seattle, and RSL. Tomorrow, Atlanta, Philadelphia, LAFC, and the LA Galaxy. El Tráfico. Getting some news out of Jersey right now with the end of the season media availability for the New York Red Bulls. Dennis Hamlet confirms that both he as the technical director, and Chris Armas will return to the Red Bulls in 2020. Uh, Hamlet would not discuss Bradley Wright Phillips or Josh Sims's future with the Red Bulls in 2020. He said, quote, we'll discuss with both of those players in the next few days. This is all coming from Mark Fishkin, who's been with us many times and is the host at Seeing Red New York, at Seeing Red NY on Twitter. Not all that shocked about Armis. I think there was a lot of people who started to make this push that it was time for him to go. He's had a year and a half. I feel like his hands were tied a little bit behind his back this season with just the lack of investment after Tyler Adams was sold and also with players wanting to leave and not being sold. Um. I don't know. Uh, Christian Dyer of of the Metro and of the Athletic said this from what Dennis Hamlet said at this media availability, talking about needing to spend to compete. He said, it's both. I think you have to have, in my opinion, a plan. You need to have a good team, second team. That's part of the process. We did go out two years ago and brought in Kaku, so we're not afraid to spend. The league has shifted. He also said the team needs to bring in, quote, difference makers. Yeah, and I think Kaku was expected to be um, one of those difference makers, and he just hasn't been as much of a difference maker as you thought he would be back. That's, I think that's fair to say. I mean, you look at his pedigree, you expect him to give more than he's given. Yeah. They still need more, and I think difference makers also from a, 
you know, replacing Tyler Adams standpoint, that's a huge one. Um, Armis said this, we didn't have a bad year. We didn't reach the goal and there are more than 20 reasons for that, but I won't sit here to discuss that. Okay. <laughs> that's kind okay. of a weird statement, but all right. Uh, John Rojas had that one. Okay. Um, <laughs> The responses to this media availability are pretty intriguing from the New York Red Bulls fans, to be honest. They are all over the place. I, I don't I don't know. I'd have to sit down and, and get into this a little bit more. They're gonna have to spend some money because I, I'm with the idea of developing talent from within and, and that should be the base and I agree. But where that talent is not ready or hasn't developed yet, or you've just hit a gap in a certain position you've got to spend some money to compete and and it becomes a question and i think red bulls fans have a, a valid question about this what is the goal is it to produce players and move them on is it to sell players well then why didn't you sell players when they had an interest in going and it sounds like there were offers on the table is it to win trophies well if it is then you have to upgrade some positions on this team just flat out so I don't know. It can't be in between the two. It's it's you've got to you do have to have that plan, and I don't know what that plan is right now. And that's something the Red Bulls are going to have to figure out. They are going to have to replace Connor Laid, who, who's been with them for a number of years, uh, developed player through the Red Bulls organization. He has announced his retirement. Um, Laid a lot of times became a versatile outside player could play in the midfield played a little bit inside as a holding midfielder mostly as an outside back um utility i mean he would play on the right side for mario play on the left side for lawrence he, he could play a lot of different positions that's a tough spot to replace at times and a player like connor laid who's been there for a long time and gets what the club is all about and gets the way they want to play those are tricky ones and those are ones ideally that you would love to develop from within because they, they get the feeling of the club, but it's also not something that's easily developed. So that's a, an underrated one that you might want to keep an eye on. I'm really curious to see if Bradley Wright Phillips is back. I'm curious to see if they keep Josh Sims. I think those yep. are very important decisions. And as Dylan Butler writes for the athletic MLS soccer, or pro soccer USA and MLS soccer.com points out, Roster compliance isn't until November 21st. So they've got plenty of time. Um, they don't have to pick up options yet. They don't have to decline options yet. They don't have to make those decisions. So they've got some time to figure it out. I think the, the movement around the league might impact a little bit of what they're going to do with certain players. So keep an eye on Red Bulls. It's, uh, it's an intriguing one. But let's move on back to the Twitter timeline. What else do we have? Michael Head, kickoff times. Tell me the real time and I'll be there, 10 to 15 prior to it. Do not tell me a 3 p.m. kick and the real kickoff is 325, looking at Univision. Thank you all yeah. for giving us the actual kick times. I really use your times to plan my stadium arrival. Well, cool. I mean, that's, we, we try to help. Um, I get it from a business perspective. I get it from a TV perspective. I get it from selling the ads. I understand. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a catch 22. I mean, if you announce the time as, as three twenty five, and you set up a pregame show in your TV bracket, are you going to be able to get the same money from advertisers for your pregame show? I'd like to think you could try to sell it that way, but I'm not in that business. So I'm assuming that's why you don't. Yeah. It's annoying. It, I think when it's eight minutes after the, the time, Okay. That's if it's standard TV. more than that, yeah, it's a little much. Yeah. Yeah, usually the way that it works is, and honestly, it depends on what comes on in front of you and what the plan is, because sometimes you'll have something kick off at 02 if you're a part of a doubleheader. The Sometimes Premier you'll have League something. typically kicks off then. I, the the yeah. double headers don't usually do that. Like you're not coming on for game one and it starts at 02. It's the second game might start yes. right at the advertised time because you've right. got a built in pregame. But the Premier League, 
I mean, how many times do you see it where the the preceding game is on NBCSN, they have their post game, they're previewing the next game, and it's like, okay, we're going off here, go over to NBC, game starting Boom. now. And it's, yep. yeah, immediately, like, Arlo White's like, hey, welcome to the game, here's kickoff. Yep. So. And most of the time, though, it's 06 or 08 under normal circumstances. If, MLS, you're, yeah, if your pregame show is the half hour previous, but now in building revenue and having those kinds of pregame opportunities, like you see on Monday Night Football, you've got the pregame show, the pre-kick, all these little elements that are breaking it down and pushing things later and later into the half hour. So that's, yeah, I completely understand it, but it is strictly for sales to sit there and say, we're in the game window for doing whatever sport we're doing so we can charge a higher ad rate for any advertiser. Yeah, I mean, it is a business after all. Let's look at Philadelphia. Let's look at what they could be doing tomorrow night. Last 10 games of the regular season, Philadelphia played a 4-2-3-1 from the start six times. They played a 4-4-2 four times. The season, overwhelming majority of the matches, they were in a version of the 4-4-2, typically a diamond at times. And, and this is where formations are... We get really worked up about formations, but a four four two slash four three one two slash four one three two slash four two 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 are all the same thing. It's roughly the same thing. The important things when you talk about formation are how many center backs, how many forwards. You want to take it to the next level. What does the width look like? Those are the important things. Like there was a, a good question on on Twitter yesterday about during the match and in the post game on Saturday, I, I called the move that Frank DeBoer made going to the four four two because that's the way I interpreted it with Ezekiel Barco, who had been up top with Joseph Martinez still playing the forward role, although he was dropping in deeper. Still, I considered him a forward. The two holding midfielders, Tio Vialba on the left side, Julian Gressel on the right, I considered that a 4-4-2 to match what New England was doing. But New England, the way they were shaped, it was 4-4-2 that you call a 4-3-3, in the way that it actually played out sometimes, and you could call it a few different things the way it played out a few times as well. It was a little different than the first time they played. Frank DeBoer interpreted it as a as a four three three, which would mean that he's looking at the positioning as Vialba and Gressel as forwards wide with Joseph Martinez in the middle and Ezekiel Barco deeper behind Joseph and in the midfield trio. It's roughly the same thing, like yeah. you know what I mean. Like it, it's yeah. it's where you want to put them in a line, like how they actually played it. Four three three four four two. It's the same thing. Like it's the exact same thing. So when you get into formations, we can get a little too worked up about the numbers. But for Philadelphia, it is an important distinction here because their four four two is much more narrow than their four two three one. The four four two. Your width is primarily coming from your outside backs getting forward and Kai Wagner and Raymond Gaddis. In the 4 2 3 1, your width is coming from Brandon Aronson moving over to the left wing instead of playing centrally and really stretching the field wider. Fafa Pico has played as a winger in the 4 2 3 1. He's been effective there. We've seen Ilsino play as a winger in a 4-2-3-1, either to start or when they shift to it. Very different way of interpreting it, but he's been very effective there. But he's been wide, truly wide. In the 4-4-2, and this is why sometimes it gets called a 4-3-1-2 or a 4-1-3-2, it's much more compact centrally and you're trying to boss the game in the middle of the park go back to canada usa go back to usa trying to build out of the back 
go back to how they really struggled to do it because one, Canada pressed in a 4-4-2 diamond, and two, they had more red shirts around the ball on a regular basis than there were U.S. players because of the way they were structured. Philadelphia likes to play that kind of way in their 4-4-2. They want to press. They want two up top that are going to press. They then want that block in the middle that makes it so difficult to play through. They want to make you go out wide, and then they expect Wagner and Gattis to be effective in those spots. If they play the 4-2-3-1, it's different. Now, when they press... Pressing is very different because it becomes a little bit more of a 4 2 4. Because what happens in their press and in those scenarios is the number 10, whether it's Mark Fabian, whether it's Jamiro Montero, they step up with the forward in the 4 2 3 1 to give you the look of two forwards without when you're not in possession, when you're defending, when you're in a, in a pressing scenario. But you still have your wide players who step up as well. And if you're playing four in the back against Philadelphia pressing with their four two three one that turns into a four two four, that's one v one. That's difficult. That's what causes turnovers. That's what gives the opponent opportunities. But if you're Atlanta in their normal three five two and Philadelphia does that, you can retreat into a line of five if you need to to play through the press. Your wing backs become your additional players but you also have three center backs to deal with their two who are pressing you in that scenario you should have an extra man to play through it those things are really important and philadelphia the decision they make here is critical what jumped out to me is looking back at the last two matches of the season now some of this factors into the travel of the final week where in that final week of the season before decision day, the week before, where, where Philadelphia had to go to Red Bull Arena, go to San Jose, and then go to Columbus. They flipped back and forth between the 4 2 3 1 and the 4 4 2. They were 4 4 2 in San Jose. They won. They were 4 2 3 1 at Red Bull Arena, at Columbus, and on decision day against New York City, and they lost all those. In the 4 2 3 1, in the six games out of the final two months of the season, Philadelphia. Only won twice. In the 4-4-2, they were 3-1. I think they're better in the 4-4-2. And I think then it gives them the opportunity to go to the 4-2-3-1 with Ilsenio's inclusion and changing the way that they've been playing. That's tough for an opponent to adjust to. I think that gives them more options than starting in the 4-2-3-1 because you're not going to go to the 4-4-2 out of it generally, especially if you don't start El Sino. You're going to bring him on, and he has to play in the 4-2-3-1. They tried him as the 10 in the 4-4-2. It doesn't really work. You could play him in a free roll as a second forward. They haven't really done that either. When El Sino's on the field, they kind of have to be in a 4-2-3-1. I think the change, if Philadelphia is set up to do it, and I thought they did it really effectively in the match against Red Bulls, where in the 4-4-2, look, I think the moment was maybe a little bit too big for Philadelphia early on. I think they made some kind of silly decisions in trying to play through the Red Bulls' pressure. Now, the Red Bulls lost their legs, ran out of gas, lost their composure, whatever, and the press became far less effective after about 20 minutes. But I thought Philadelphia playing 4-4-2 and then flipping the switch to the 4-2-3-1 really was a huge factor in that win for the Union. I think they should start that way. I don't know if that's what they do. Because of the Alejandro Doya injury, that complicates it. I think That's what he, I was going to ask. He's the perfect fit for the 4-4-2 because he can read the game and drop deeper if Harris Medunian needs extra help. He can step up higher and help the attack. He can drift out wide if you have to help Wagner or Gaddis. I think he's the the soccer brains of that team in the 4-4-2. If he's not there, then you're looking at Warren Creval replacing him, who's more of a true defensive midfielder. Medunian doesn't have the legs to play the Bedoya role. Creval, I don't think, is the same mentality. 
Jamiro Montero can play it. I, I think they're most effective in the 4-4-2 with Medunian in at the base, with Doya and Montero, who are both do-it-all central midfielders, and Brandon Aronson as the 10. Because then Aronson can jump up and sometimes make it a line of three pressing. He can drift out wide and find space, but he can he's free then. He's not thinking defensively as much, although his defending has gotten a lot better. Without Bedoya, you don't have as much balance in your 4-4-2, and, and maybe that's the thinking. Maybe that's the idea. That seemed to be the idea on decision day where it was Medunian and, and Jamiro Montero sitting behind Brendan Aronson in a 4-2-3-1, and you lost to NYC 2-1. I think their best midfield has Bedoya in it, but is Bedoya ready to go? If he's not, you might lose that opportunity to start one way and switch and throw the opponent off. Do you think, uh, what's it looking like up top again for you? Same as it was uh, against Red Bulls, Santos and Vuki? It has to be. Um, well, that's in the four four two. If it's a four two three one, it's just Santos. And I'm I'm thinking if Bedoya can't start, it's a four two three one, and it's Santos up top. And then the question is, do you want to just completely go YOLO and start Il Senio? I wouldn't. If I was I'd feeling bring him in 60, because you have to think of it as full, full for 120. Yeah. Yeah, that's where you always bring him in. I think that's what you have to do because I don't think you can get enough out of him to make that work unless you feel like the best route is to just blow out early to try to catch an Atlanta back line that is going to be different faces in different places. It's, it's going to be some adjustment. If you say, you know what, let's just let's blow this out, put the pressure on them, go 4-2-3-1, start Il Senio, and just go for it early knowing – that we're going to have to pull Il Senio at the 60-minute mark. But if you do that, you can't start Bedoya. Because Bedoya, I don't think you can trust him to finish 120 if you get there. I don't know if he can finish 90. Right. And if you're going to start Il Senio, you know he's not going to be effective after 60 to 75 minutes, and you're going to have to think sub there. You don't want two guys in that scenario. That's some of the wild cards here. That's what makes this difficult for Frank DeBoer because, one, if they start 4-4-2, you have to expect them to go 4-2-3-1 with the Il Senio sub. If they start 4-2-3-1, it's very different in their pressing. I think their pressing can be even more effective. How do you handle that? How do you deal with that? What's going to be best for your group to deal with those things? Because you don't have all your normal cards to play. You don't have a lot of you, – you have a lot of options in what your lineup looks like. You don't have a lot of tactical options here. It's going to be a little bit more about where your comfort level is with your group in do you play three center backs, do you play two? Do you play a line of four? Do you play the line of three with it sometimes becoming the line of five? What option do you – go with with the group you have that is going to give you the best comfort level and the best performance you might not get to do that based off what you expect out of Philadelphia I think you're thinking about it but you're not picking from a full deck here of options so in my opinion it becomes more important to get your comfort level right than to think as much about Philadelphia you want to deal with what Philadelphia is going to do as much as possible, but I don't know how much flexibility you can build into your starting 11 when you're you're already a couple defenders short. It's going to be tough. A couple more before we go. Two in the queue. Ike Mann with our FIFA 20 question. He says, Joseph's the last player I'd pick to play lights out. If no one can get him the ball, it wouldn't matter. My lights out player is PT. If he played at his top potential, it would be a game changer. Second pick LGP, third pick is Goose. Hashtag Wall Pass Wednesday. I'm just thinking defense is, is the bigger question mark here, and that's why I went LGP. I mean, it, it's great if your attacking players play lights out. I think they play lights out far more often, and they've been far more consistent this season. LGP, for me, is the the biggest potential difference maker in this one, either way. 
because we know what his quality is. We've seen it so many times. He's been one of the best center backs over his three years here in Atlanta. But in 2019, he's had some inconsistent moments. And at this time of year, those are the moments that can hurt you. And when you get to a game like this one where you're going to be missing your two steady rock kind of defenders in Robinson and Parkhurst, you need LGP to be a rock. Yep. I think he's got to be. And then Jorge B. with the expansion thought from this morning, he says there's a possibility of Charlotte becoming number 30 due to the proximity. Will this be a better rivalry for Atlanta United than the current one with the cowardly Purple Lions? Question mark. Hashtag Wall Pass Wednesday. Um, it depends on how you define it better. I mean, look, Orlando is a rivalry because there's animosity there at this point. So that's going to give it a rivalry edge to it. Red Bulls is a rivalry because of what's happened on the field and that animosity that has kicked up. Nashville, proximity can make it a rivalry. We'll see what that ends up being like. I hope it becomes a great rivalry. I think it's very cool that it'll be the first time that Atlanta fans will be able to drive in large numbers to a game and make a weekend of it. Um, hopefully that game is on a on a Saturday night. Sunday early afternoon whatever you're going to do and Atlanta fans can go up for the weekend in Nashville and vice versa when Nashville fans come down to Atlanta Charlotte can be the same Uh, anytime you get a game like that where you can get that traveling fan side of it you kick it up to another potential level and give it time I mean it might you get the fans in the building it might be all friendly at first but you get a game where it's contentious and people are kicking one another and you get red cards and or somebody knocks somebody out of the playoffs or whatever, then things find another level. And I think Nashville and Charlotte, both, if Charlotte gets in, both will have the potential to be bigger rivalries than Orlando because of that traveling fan component. But they won't start that way because you have other games that already have that animosity. The animosity is going to have to build with Nashville and Charlotte a little bit. And it, it could happen it could happen in 30 minutes in the first time they face each other. Yeah. If somebody punts Joseph off the field, Atlanta fans are going to hate that team and hate that player. So Yeah, studs up on a red. Yeah, I mean, that's where you're at. So, But I think that just the potential for travel will kick those up to a level above anything else if the, the matchup on the field match that. We are caught up, sir. All right, so that means later today, here's the rest of my day. Um, Not yet. We're we're getting to it. So the rest of my day, 1240, Andy and Randy on the Midday Show on 92.9 The Game on the Radio.com app. 2 o'clock, stoppage time with Mike Conti from the 92.9 The Game studios, facebook.com slash 92.9 The Game, 2 to 3. Watch, send in questions, laugh at us. Tell jokes, whatever you want to. It gets out of hand. Then four o'clock bowling at the bowling. 99 the game V103 Rock and Jock Celebrity Bowling Tournament. Come out, hang out at Stars and Strikes in Sandy Springs. If you can bowl, if you are interested in bowling, I got some spots for you. But you've got to send me a message on Twitter ASAP so I can get you on the list and get you in. You gotta be there around three o'clock to get signed up if you can do it. So send me a message if you can come join me. I'll be up there bowling with the rest of the crew. So many of the 92.9, the game personalities, so many of the V103 personalities. More than likely, I'm going to stick around if people are there and want to watch NYC and Toronto because winner of that, winner of tomorrow, that's your Eastern Conference final, and tonight's game will affect where that Eastern Conference final will be. New York City wins it. It's going to be at Yankee Stadium next week. If Toronto wins it, they're traveling to either Atlanta or Philadelphia, and we'll know who that is tomorrow, hopefully just after 10 o'clock, hopefully not too much later, but it is a possibility. It is the postseason, extra time, potential for penalties, all the chaos. You get your appetizers tonight. Seattle and RSL is your late night snack. Getting ready for tomorrow at the Benz, Atlanta and Philly. We'll be back in the morning on SDH. We'll get you all set for Atlanta, Philly. Doug Robertson joins us. Mike Conti joins us. Thanks, everybody, for listening. It was great to see so many people last night at the Brew House for Copa Libertadores. 
Mucha plata, y'all. Mucha plata.